Welcome to Economics and Beyond. I'm Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Wendy Brown, class of 1936 first chair at the University of California, Berkeley, where she teaches political theory. She's written, in my opinion, two fabulous recent books, the first being Undoing the Demos, Neoliberalism's Stealth Revolution, and more recently, In the Ruins of Neoliberalism, the rise of anti-democratic politics in the West. Wendy, thanks for joining me today. It's a pleasure to be here, Rob. Thank you. Well, we are speaking here in June of 2020. The pandemic, COVID-19 is upon us. All kinds of social unrest, economic distress certainly uh, gives pause to anybody who thought everything was hunky-dory, say, at the turn of the year. Now, you have been a very, very prescient writer. The two books that I mentioned in introducing you illuminate all kinds of shortcomings, fault lines, which you might call unrealized or unrecognized assumptions that uh, masked over many processes and many experiences that we have, whether it be with arts or education, environment, inequality, it, it covers vast amount of what you might call the diagnostic material of a social critic in a very powerful way. So I'm curious, right at the outset, you're seeing the pandemic, you're seeing the world. What is disturbing? What is, what would you recommend and what is inspiring that you see in light of this challenge? Those are huge questions and I'm hoping we'll, we'll take the better part of this hour to open them up. But why don't we start with, why don't we just start with the challenge of the pandemic? Okay. Disease pandemics, they're always challenging for societies, but the, the challenges are of course, ramified when everything that organizes and provisions a society is already weakened or broken. And let's just take the tour here. The U.S. has a broken healthcare system. Not only uh, do we have unequal access as a result of an almost but not quite successful effort at producing universal health care, we have a healthcare system that is instead fragmented, inefficient, largely organized by for profit industries, including hospitals, clinics, pharmaceuticals, with accompanying profoundly unequal access and quality. For most Americans, health insurance is tied to employment, and 30 to 40 million people lost their jobs in the pandemic, hence, are at risk of losing their insurance. On top of that, we have a hospital system that, of course, is mostly privately owned, which means it tries to stay full in healthy times and was absolutely overwhelmed during the pandemic. We have a broken political system, profoundly corrupted by private money and influence. It's log jammed, as we all know, at the congressional level, and of course is currently headed by a raging narcissistic authoritarian with absolutely no concern for the welfare of the people, only for his own power and image. But beyond Trump, we have a broken social contract, a contract that one could say was never fulfilled for black, brown, indigenous, and poor people, but now it fails almost everyone. In exchange for being law-abiding and effortful, even many working class and middle class white Americans now lack basic protection and provisioning that they need to survive, let alone thrive. Then we have an economic order that, as we know, is looted at the top by the banks, big industries, plutocrats, while most are one paycheck away from living on the streets. Deregulation and speculation has created scandalous urban housing costs. The average rent for a one-bedroom, I just looked it up, in San Francisco, a one-bedroom apartment, is 3,500 a month. So not surprisingly, one in five, I'm sorry, one in 50 San Franciscans are homeless. 
And then there's the entire American public education system from kindergarten to college, which over the last 40 years has been steadily defunded, privatized, outsourced, and of course, importantly, devalued over this time. And while that education system groans, billions of tax dollars pour into our prison system, which now holds more than 2 million Americans and incarcerates one in 12 black men. Then there's our corporately owned media, which is completely politicized with the effect that about a third of Americans watch or listen to what they imagine is news, but is really nothing short of right-wing propaganda. So given this context, it's actually not any surprise that the U.S. has one of the highest COVID rates in the world. It's been unable to respond intelligently or effectively to the pandemic to provision its healthcare workers with the most basic protective gear or organize universal testing or provide quality care for the sick. And it's un unsurprising that we've been unable to secure those who just got dropped through the floor by the sudden economic shutdown. It's not really a surprise either that Congress passed an economic rescue package CARES Act in March, that was the single greatest upward redistribution of wealth in the history of capitalism. And I think for many, the CARES Act represented this great moment where everybody got $1,500 checks to tide them over during a time of crisis. But what we really need to pay attention to in the CARES Act is that it was a huge bailout for giant industries and a huge tax cut for corporations and the wealthy, while throwing these little one-time checks at the many. Finally, I would say it's no surprise that, that uh, really an unprecedentedly disintegrated and undereducated public weaned on libertarian freedoms and weaned on rage against government rebelled, rebelled against restrictions and closures and refuse to participate in what I would call the worldwide mutual pact that social distancing demanded. And it's also not any surprise that, that Blacks and Latinos are dying of COVID at three times the rate of whites. So there's our pandemic, the crisis that exposes not just the problem of dealing with a pandemic, but the problems that already existed in our society, in our polity, in our economy, in our culture. And, and I'll just kind of end this part of, of, of my answer to your question by saying, look, capitalism everywhere limits the possibilities of having certain principles that I think ought to be the principles that govern us actually govern us. Principles of equality, social care, social trust. But the United States, the Soviet Union and Brazil, each with the screamingly highest COVID rates in the world, they represent the absence of these principles in the extreme. And then you get a little country like New Zealand at the other end of the spectrum. Recall that um, Prime Minister Arden had just 100 cases in the country, but had the, the catastrophe in Italy already in her sights in February when she said to the people, look, stay home, be kind, be careful. We'll take care of you if you take care of yourself. And what did that entail? It entailed a two-month shutdown, but it also entailed government assurance that no one would lose income or security or housing or health care during this time. Now, New Zealand's not a perfect country. No settler colony is. No capitalist nation is. And now, of course, like everyone else, it has to deal with the, uh, the effects of, a, of the shutdown with businesses shuttered and unemployment rates and so forth. But what it modeled was the foregrounding of social care, policy rooted in public health and high levels of trust and commitment to equality in handling this problem. And that's what's required to navigate a pandemic humanely and effectively. That's what New Zealand could bring to it. And that nation, of course, is now essentially free of the virus. Do you uh, 
I believe I believe Robert Bella, who wrote the book The Broken Covenant, is one of your colleagues, or at least was at, at Berkeley. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Well, I remember a famous saying. My dear friend and former partner in projects, uh, Alex Gibney, the documentary filmmaker, his stepfather was William Sloan Coffin. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember reading Bella's book, The Broken Covenant, which popped into my mind as you opened the discussion. And he had a quote from Coffin where he said, but today, because we have so cruelly separated freedom from virtue, because we define freedom in a morally inferior way, a country is stalled in what Herman Melville called the dark ages of democracy, a time when, as he predicted, the new Jerusalem would turn into Babylon and Americans would feel the arrest of hope's advance. That's a remarkable passage, and I, I think it captures at a poetic level what um, those of us who uh, operate in the social sciences are trying to kind of map out uh, at the very empirical level, but <clears throat> it captures it beautifully. Instead of freedom being that which we share in order to govern ourselves, instead of freedom being that which we cultivate, through knowledge and education and um, pursuit of the ability to craft our lives together and to, and to produce a common good, a public good together, and to tend it and to figure out how to solve problems through it, we have fallen into the most extreme version of freedom as a right essentially to social assault, to do what you want, and to attack or tear at society, a, a freedom understood as that which is about your individual right to do whatever you want, no matter who it kills, no matter who it hurts, no matter who who's um, profiting at whose expense. And <clears throat> certainly one can't say that's not freedom, but it's not democratic freedom. That's that's what we've lost. It's a, It's a form of you could call it barbaric freedom. You could call it market freedom. You could call it libertarian freedom, but it's a form of freedom that has been so radically detached from the social and the political task of living life together and deciding together how we shall live, what we shall value, uh, that, it, that it, it essentially becomes freedom against democracy. It becomes freedom against the public good. And that's where we are. Yeah, I, uh, people who listen to this podcast will know I'm very fond of a poem that was created by Muhammad Ali. And it was consider it's considered by the Guinness Book of World Records the shortest poem in history. Uh-huh. It goes like this. Me, we. There and we yeah. when, when I'm hurting... And as I'm listening to you, I'm, I'm feeling like that kind of freedom that you were exp explaining to our listeners is a freedom to do whatever you want, but it's not a freedom from the consequences of other people's actions. And so I don't know, you know, we're not all Robinson Caruso's living on an island alone. So the, the notion of freedom has a we in it as well as a me. And it just feels like that liber libertarian style. And the, the, it, it's not even just a despondency about government. It's, it's a disparagement of social responsibility. That's and right. But it's, it, how do we get there? It goes further. It's a disparagement of the very idea of society. I found one of the most telling moments in the early outbursts against um, shutdown and social distancing protocols that were coming from parts of the country that we conventionally associate with Trump supporters or with um, a certain understanding of anti-government 
or even anti-society thinking. I found uh, the, the following sentence just so revealing. One man said, look, I've done my two weeks. I'm tired of it. And I don't want anybody telling me what to do at this point. If I want to go out in the world and die, I can. Now, what I found was so fascinating about that was the utter failure to understand what social distancing and the what I call the mutual social pack of the kinds of protocols we needed to adhere to in order to bring contain the pandemic, let alone eliminate it, contain the virus, let alone eliminate it. What what was such a failure of understanding there in that episode I just cited? was the moment of saying, you know, if I want to go out in the world and die, I can, without recognizing that this was not just about oneself. It was actually about an entire society. That social distancing was never just about the individual. It was about a social Mm -hmm. practice we needed to undertake together. And it's not surprising to me that given... 40 years of neoliberalism where freedom has been pretty much reduced to you get to do what you want with your family, with your property, with your education, with your mouth, with your opinions, with your actions, with the limitation, of course, that you're not supposed to murder anybody or or steal from others. But even those limitations, as we've been made to realize lately, uh, are not honored exactly. Um, that the, the the notion of freedom that just centers on the I, 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 it's mine and I get to do what I want. There is no such thing as society, as Margaret Thatcher famously said. Um, it's no surprise that given that, given that culture of freedom, that, that, that it, would, it would fail to be able to. I, I wanted to bring up your most recent book from the ruins of neoliberalism. And the chapter that I found just spellbinding was the fifth chapter, No Future for White Men. Mm. And you begin with the discussion of how science and reason replaced a faith in God and any other form of authority. But the words that you used were, I think Max Weber's were disenchantment. Mm-hmm. desacralization mm-hmm. that that this nihilism this resentment emanates from which you might call almost feeling abandoned by the concepts that you had come to trust in the in the which you might call the uh, magnetic field in which we all lived and collaborated but what, what do you see? I see tremendous concentration of wealth, more and more people being despondent or feeling like they're going down, life expectancy going down in the United States for over 70% of the population, according to recent statistics. But where, where, where does this nihilism, resentment, And disenchantment come from in your mind? I think it's multi-sourced. On the one hand, what I was trying to explain in that particular chapter of In the Ruins was that we can't just see nihilism as the effect of recent decades, you know, the displacement of truth by everything being mediated literally by the media, uh, you know, fiction and narrative uh, being more important than facts and science. We can't just see it as uh, the effects of the ravages of capitalist commodification. All those theses are out there. But um, by starting with Nietzsche and Weber to 19th turning the 20th century thinkers, I was trying to get at the extent to which for some time these thinkers have been warning us 
that once you have the rise of science and the rise of reason toppling the foundations of societies rooted in God or natural law, and instead everything comes to be understood as um, scientifically decodable. That's really what was at the heart of Weber's argument about disenchantment, that what science does is disenchant the world. It explains everything rather than just experiencing the world as an enchanted mystery. And what these thinkers remind us is that what happens, what we're at risk of when we lose the enchanted nature of the world and, and the belief in God as the maker and governor of the world as science and reason come to displace that, what happens isn't simply a move to, oh, okay, let's be rational creatures now who democratically decide with one another what we should do and how we should live together. What happens instead is, is the emergence of a kind of raging reaction against that loss. And one of the effects of that loss, one of the effects of that reaction itself is, is to is to produce a kind of, hmm, trying to think of the simplest way to say this here, uh, a, a release uh, from conscience and a release from um, a sense that there's any authority that one ought to obey, and instead a kind of antisocial rancor, resentment, acting out, that's very likely to emerge. And so one of the things I was trying to track in that chapter was the way that this long, steady process of disenchantment, desacralization, and, and, um, and, and reactions in response to that, one of the ways that that process intersects with the kind of, we could just call it by shorthand, hyper-capitalism that we've had of over the last 40 years where you just get to do whatever you want that increases your value or makes you money and to hell with society. You take that long process of disenchantment, desacralization, and the nihilism that goes with it, the sense of there's no meaning, there's no rules, there's, there's no authority, and you mix it with an economic form that uh unleashes all of our libidinal desires without regulation just says go for it have it take it do it um and you get a pretty disintegrated society now we're going to put one more ingredient in this that i talked about in that last chapter which is that if you also already have a society that is striated by class and race and gender and one of the effects of, we'll just call it neoliberal globalization, unleashing free trade, unleashing markets, one of the effects of that is to take what were fairly protected and secured forms of white male socioeconomic existence and drops the bottom out of those drops the bottom out of those because global markets no longer respect that position of white male socioeconomic security and international movements of peoples, migration are, are also starting to upend it and upset it. And so also our various social movements. Well, one of the nihilistic effects we have in our time is tremendous amounts of working and middle-class white male rage against lost position, lost pride of place. And that is certainly part of what we have at the basis of the right-wing movements and what are often called authoritarian populist movements, especially in Europe and the United States. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I, uh, as I was listening to you in, in, in the role of reason in science, is that uh, there is a sense, it's almost like a confidence game 
where there's a difference between science, which is a humble investigation, mm. and scientism, which is a ritual of pretending to know. It's a form of what you might call sophisticated form of demagoguery. Such an important distinction. <laughs> and, and the fact of the matter is, we just don't know what they call ontological uncertainty, or Frank Knight at Chicago called radical uncertainty. The probabilities aren't known, the outcomes aren't known, and I guess when people pretend to know and are unmasked for not knowing, the quality of which you might call the integrity and the faith and the trust in expertise or in representation or in any institution goes down the drain. Rob, and, that distinction is just so important. Go ahead. I'll let you finish. I was just going to say, uh, and, and then in the void, and this is, this is the thing that just rung my bell in your last chapter. When you talked about after the disintegration of religious values, there's a yearning for those values, and they become what I'll call cynically used for marketing because people's yearning, people's appetite for coherence still exists within them. And I think there's a there's kind of a transfer of, there's a book I've just been looking at uh, called The Enchantment of Mammon mm -hmm. by Eugene McCarver. And it's as if religion got wiped out by science and reason, but the religious instinct is then transferred to these secular institutions That's right. to fulfill yes. that emotional role. Yes. And it can be cynically exploited by what you might call Tech, psychological techniques of media, of manipulation, markets, fake news, whatever you're going to call it. So I, I feel like we're kind of like at sea in the fog without a chart as all of this unfolds. And that despondency and that despair and the increase of what your colleague at Berkeley, John Powell, calls the otherness, the scapegoating, and the polarization all just catch fire. That's right. You know, it, um, I'll go to Nietzsche again for a moment. He reminded us that it takes enormous strength to live without truth, to live without certainty. And by that, he did not mean that nothing is real. <laughs> That's often mm -hmm. you know, the mm -hmm. misunderstanding of that whole tradition of thought. He simply meant that being recognizing that for human beings, first of all, we, we're always interpreting truth, but we're also always fashioning it, especially social, political, and cultural truths. They're not given by God. They're not given by science. They're practices that we establish and then debate and then cast off and then wonder why we ever believed in them historically and so forth. Now, I think that initial distinction you drew between science and scientism is really important because I think, you know, today, for example, during the epidemic, we're all eager for those trained in epidemiology, vaccine research, and a number of other things to come up with the right vaccines and the right antivirals to be able to contain this pandemic and eventually insulate us from it. We're all eager for that, and we believe that must come from testable scientific research. That's a very different story from imagining that what the Germans call the human sciences have the same quality. Social, political, economic, cultural life, these things are not submittable to science, and our great conceit and our great mistake in trying to make them available to the same kind of scientific research that a microbe can be submitted to has been enormously consequential. On the one hand, as you say, it's, 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 it's led to certain people to, 
certain people to simply worship at the altar of these these posited truths in government or in reason or in a particular leader or or in economics. And on the other hand, it's led to a, a tremendous lack of humility in thinking and teaching and educating about human things. So instead of treating our work in thinking about markets or in thinking about social democracy as as a as an exploratory interpretive set of acts that also of course must have empirical facts they will involve some models some hypotheses but there needs to be the humility to recognize that human conduct isn't isn't sequesterable into economic behavior political behavior cultural behavior religious behavior we are always a constellation of all of these things and in, mm-hmm. and you can't break them apart and silo them off so that you can submit them to separate laboratories and that of course has been the disaster that has uh, been brought to us by each of the social sciences is the this this belief that you can so what do we get we get economics shocked by the financial crisis and then shocked again by the effects of a paradigm that turned out to be so disastrous socially and politically that even the economists recognized they had to take some responsibility for what neoliberalization was producing as its political and social effects. You get you get political scientists who were totally shocked by the rise of the right. We shouldn't have been shocked by the rise of the right. We should have been able to read the cultural and economic and social formations, crises, fissures, um, um, disaffection for, for, for government and for society that was generating for decades. We shouldn't have been shocked by 2016. But it's telling that each of these disciplines is so unprepared for the eruptions of this moment, or the eruptions that 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 um, that that, as it were, falsify what the discipline has believed in, and it's telling that they're unprepared for it because they're they're working in their little I'm going to say now pseudo scientific silos as if you could submit the complexity, the historicity. Uh, the interdependent nature of of human existence in all of its various facets to these siloed experiments the way you can with a microbe. And I oh. think that 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 distinction you make for for that reason is really important, but it's really hard to bear. I'm going to return to where I started. It's hard to bear the fact that we do not have scientific truths to live by in society, politics, and economics, that instead we have to craft Mm -hmm. forms of organization and forms of, of, and and institutions and arrangements um, that we're always experimenting with and, and, and that we always have to be willing um, to, to back off and say, oh, we got that wrong. We, we really need to think differently about this. We, we forgot to think about X and Y while we were over here thinking about A and B. Mm, that's not the way most social science works. Yeah. Well, I think there are two thoughts that come to my mind. The first is, with regard to social science, the subject and object are intertwined in thinking. Yes. <laughs> and so that, that kind of scrambles up some sort of causal, mechanical, consistent link well, it's scrambled and, what, what scientists like to call objectivity. They 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 would they would deplore the statement that you just made. You know, the subject and the object are not supposed to be intertwined for them. They imagine that by mathematizing, they can get away mm-hmm. from being involved with their object. But yeah. go ahead. And well, the other part, and I think this relates to humility, is that, and and I'm I'm really echoing what you were just saying. Society does yearn for order. Society wants to feel like they know what's going on, what can be trusted, etc. So if you have inherent uncertainty, 
no one knows and no one can know definitively. But there's almost like a, a leapfrog game, or what they call in music a cutting contest, where you try to outshine each other by being more bold in your declarations and more sure of what you say. And unfortunately, I guess what I would say is society's yearning for order is complicit in sometimes propelling the least humble con men to the forefront. But Um, when they're unmasked, when they're unmasked, all hell breaks loose. Yes, that's right. Uh, I, I, I guess I would compliment what you said by saying societies as a whole may yearn for order, but I, I, Beyond that, I'm not sure I would say there's a kind of ontological yearning in any particular society that exceeds the culture shaping it. And and, and here's what I mean. Um, You could say societies yearn for order, but what about also the statement, well, societies yearn for freedom? And... Mm -hmm. Are they yearning for freedom and order, or are they yearning for freedom against the current order? And maybe we'll talk about this a little bit later, but it seems to me that part of what we're seeing in the last couple of weeks with the uprisings um, under the auspices of Black Lives, instigated by the murder of George Floyd, is is the emergence of a a sub-society, and a pretty big one, yearning for freedom from this order. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. but I don't want to say all societies uh, have that yearning. I I want to suggest that, um, you know, when things feel dark enough, dismal enough, pessimistic enough, indeed nihilistic at a at a societal level, as they have for the past some years in this country, um, I th- I think you get different eruptions, different other things are cultivated as 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 deep yearnings besides yeah. simply order. Yeah. Well, uh, what I might mean, say, okay, an oppressive order that leads to despondency, say regarding the possibilities for my children, is is haunting, and it, it it's not reassuring. That's right. And and I think, uh, I, but I do think I, I always. I often quote Stephen Toulman, who wrote a book called Cosmopolis, because he, he talked about from the 30 years war to the present, this failing of social science by pretending to be natural science often led in the Cartesian Enlightenment framework to fault lines that erupted. But at the time when the challenge, the social breakdown occurred, People often yearn to go back to the familiar rather than to push forward and evolve. In other words, learning from those fault lines and moving to a different right. place. Yes. And and here we have to note, if we're just focused on, on um, let's say, the U.S. or maybe more broadly, the Euro-Atlantic world, the global north, one one of the things we see is that tremendous yearning to go back a nostalgia for an imagined time when neighborhoods were calm and white and men ruled households and people of color stayed in their place, preferably outside the country for the most part, but those who were within stayed subjected. There's a nostalgia for an imagined other time um, that feels at risk being lost, uh, of, of being lost, but also at risk of, of disappearing forever. But then, you know, as you say, invoking your children, we also see a millennial generation that finds this world not only unbearable, but unsustainable, knows yes. that it has no place in the future and that that ridiculous nostalgia for the past is just that, a ridiculous nostalgia for a past that was never 
bright and beautiful for most. And um, also that had nothing to do with a sustainable economy, society, or planet. So there we, we have to watch out, I think, about generalizing uh, from, from, uh, from the idea that there's a, a kind of desire for a return in the midst of a crisis. I think we also have to see the, the yearning that this generation in particular, this young generation, is expressing for what in the early anti-globalization protests was captured by the phrase, another world is possible. They want a world that um, mm -hmm. actually is humane, is sustainable, is non-racist, it, it does feature equality among the sexes, um, isn't punishing and cruel, and doesn't have the extremes of economic uh, inequality, not, to, not even to mention North-South global inequality. And, and that, that uh, I think it's, it's a big generational divide, although I don't think it's exclusively generational. Um, but I do think that there's a, a, a world that, that knows that it's lo losing and almost finished. That's what we see in the world that the, the GOP in this country is still trying to cultivate. Uh, and then, then there's another population um, looking at a very different horizon. No nostalgia at all for that past. <laughs> right. That's right. So... We've seen just what you might call an eruption of protests all over the world in the aftermath of George Floyd's passing. And I've seen some who are in power try to use this as what you might call evidence that all hell's breaking loose and we need to be tougher on, quote, those people, yes, including the President of the United States. But it feels to me, and I'm in New York, but it feels to me as I watch all around that we're in a place that's um, not containable. The, the scale and the awareness, the awakening to the contradictions, to the unsustainability, socially and environmentally in particular, is where people have just, they've just had it. And watching that poor man on the video with a knee in his neck for nine minutes, it, it was, it was horrid. But it was it was our society, yes. and I think I think we've unlocked now a political energy, a broad based participation. And to me, that's the most hopeful thing I could have imagined at this point. How do you see this? I, I agree with you completely. I think the last two weeks have brought us. more hope, broad-based and deep, than anything, anything in the last four decades. And I guess I would start by saying a couple of things about how we might understand what, what, what released and inspired and, and, and fueled these uprisings. I mean, as you say, Floyd's <clears throat> cold-blooded murder by a white policeman was itself horrible, but it was also gasoline poured on already smoldering fires. Mm -hmm. I mean, there have been scores of such videos in recent years, and just prior to the one of Floyd, of course, there was the murder of Ahmad Arbery, the black jogger, mm -hmm. Breonna mm -hmm. Taylor, the black healthcare worker, but also, I think this is really important, the video of the iconic encounter between the white woman and the black man in New York Central Park. Oh, in um, Central Park, yeah. Yeah. So just, I mean, you know this, but just to remind listeners, um, this middle-class white woman was angered by 
the middle class black man's request that she obey a park rule to leash her dog. And she responded by attempting to openly terrorize him by telling him she would call the police and report that she was being threatened by, and these were her words, an African-American man. And then she proceeded to do exactly that. She called the police and three times repeated that an African-American man was threatening her and her dog, and at one point said threatening her life and her dogs. Of course, he was doing no such thing. But what this video did was capture the utter normalcy of white America using the police to terrorize black America. Mm-hmm. And I think if you combine all of that with the fact that already, and now we're going to go back to COVID, due to systematic racism in housing, education, healthcare, employment, access to nutritious food, and other elements of well being, African Americans have three times the COVID mortality rates of whites. And they also, at the same time, have filled out the ranks of undervalued, underpaid essential workers during the crisis. So here they are, serving the country in countless ways, from healthcare delivery to food delivery, and yet they're the least protected, most afflicted, with the greatest numbers of deaths. So there you get the picture already of slavery repeated in the 21st century, and then you get these murders and these encounters. And of course, they're also living under the most blatantly racist political regime in recent history, where, where racial hate episodes have become routinized public, normal. Mm -hmm. And you put all that together and the house blew up. Thank God. But I agree with you that the uprisings in some ways now exceed these moments and protests against this condition. I mean, they've really been the most amazing thing. Not only are they a powerful rebellion against white supremacy, but through them a whole generation is getting educated and politicized, but also the deep fatalism, the deep despair that has hung heavy over black and brown communities, but in some ways also over all who care about justice. That deep fatalism and despair is being pushed back. That that deep political pessimism and powerlessness is being exploded. Yes. And... They, these protests, I find, you know, striking in the cities where you and I live, but there are thousands of them going on in towns and villages all over the country. And, and all over the world. <laughs> all over the world, of course, too. But, yeah. I mean, just thinking about the way it's blown the top off the pessimism, the despair, the fatalism, the nothing can be done, it's hopeless, this raging lunatic is in power and look at all the people who support him and so on. And, you know, the complicity of the GOP and so forth. And now what you have are young people, old people, families, relatively apolitical people too, in the streets, finding their voice, finding the solidarity with others. Look, when even the National Football League apologizes for its past complicity with white supremacy, we're Mm -hmm. in a political earthquake as we know the nfl well we don't need to go down that road but you know it's 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 an important sign that that particular operation has turned around and essentially without saying his name apologized to colin kaepernick for being a visionary and them not recognizing it now i just want to add a few more things please certainly the immediate issue of murderous racial violence by the police, by the carceral state, by vigilante groups, random middle class white people in Central Park, capitalism, that's all part of what's promulgating this. But I think there's something else. Nearly three months of having to have sheltered in place and worrying about COVID gave a lot of people a lot of time to reflect on the world we live in, how it's organized, what's prioritized, what's valued, what's devalued, what's deeply wrong. You know, why was this country so unable to even handle basic supply chain issues around food? Why were farmers dumping food in fields while people were hungry in cities? 
because the farmers previously had supplied high-end restaurants and couldn't get the supply chains redirected to where the food was needed. All of that's playing out in, for, in front of us while we're sheltering in place. And of course, the shutdown itself also did something, which was feature immediately how the climate crisis could be redressed by redirecting our extractivist economy and our fossil fuel dependent economy in a different direction. I mean, you know, suddenly we had, everyone commented on it, clear skies, breathable air, but also human life was reduced to the simple requirements of surviving and taking care of ourselves and each other, getting food and shelter and healthcare and having basic internet connection. That's what mattered. So mm -hmm. what am I saying here? There was room during this time to think about the way we live together and what's wrong with so-called normal. Everyone wanted to get back to normal. Almost everybody I know, and these were not just progressives, were also, those people were also questioning normal. They were thinking about normal. And I think part of what's behind the explosion in the streets is not just, though it's not nothing, a reaction to this murderous racial violence and not just, oh, thank God we're out of our houses. Let's explode out of our houses. Let's go back to the demo tomorrow. That's the most humanity I've seen in the, you know, three months. I think part of what the, is behind the explosion in the streets is no more normal. A better world is possible and it's time to make it right now. And as it's built, the sense of, you know, Trump hanging out in his bunkered, fenced, um, fortified White House and the recognition that the people really are not going to leave the streets and they're not going to be faked out by white supremacists, you know, throwing Molotov cocktails or some looting going on. Instead, they are just going to hang in and demand a better world. We have a convergence here of some crises that usually become the opportunistic moment for the right and, and, and the powerful, but they become the opportunistic moment for the people. And uh, that's rare and it's wonderful and I'm incredibly hopeful from this set of possibilities. Yeah, I think the, uh, if, I, if I were doing the soundtrack, which is kind of my propensity, I'd have to pick Elaine Brown's song, Seize the Time, as yep. the anthem for, for right now. This is a time that is filled with horrific and frightening observation, but it's also a time of great potential. And as you explored over the course of this conversation, uh, there's an awful lot that's unsustainable. And particularly, what I find it hard to understand is how our politics as usual with high unemployment is not seizing upon what you might call the employment potential from a, of a profound public program for energy transformation to start retraining and hiring people for what you might call invigorating the economy in the macroeconomic sense, but most importantly, transforming the structure of the economy to a sustainable place vis-a-vis -vis energy. Absolutely. And, and the scale, the mobilization that I sense is required over the next 10 to 15 years is, is gargantuan. And, and it's all over the world. It's in India, it's in China, it's in Europe, Latin America, the United States. But I, but I, I, I pray that we seize this time. And my children and my first grandson was born about a little over a year ago. I just, I can't, I can't imagine us going back. The, the awakening and the scar tissue are both far too profound. And Wendy, as I try to do my job, fulfill my mission and my purpose at the head of 
the Institute for New Economic Thinking. There isn't anybody I know who's given me more clues and insights as to where the fault lines were hiding in plain sight than you. I look Thank forward you. so much to working with you. I hope to see you again on this podcast before too much time passes. And I really want to encourage everybody to read the two books, Undoing the Demos and From the Ruins and Neoliberalism. Maybe next time you and I talk, we can choose a theme, which is how must education be reformed to reinforce this awakening and this new understanding that we have to craft. But for today, I just want to thank you, as always, for an excellent contribution. Rob, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Um, and I'm just delighted that you're doing this work with the INET podcasts. And I'd be enormously pleased to talk to you about the future of education. My own investments in public high edu higher education are huge. Uh, and it's been part of my work now for some years to uh, try to preserve the great American experiment in provisioning public higher education for the many. Uh, and so it would be a real pleasure to have that conversation with you in the future. But in the moment, I just want to say thank you for being such a great conversationalist. Well, thank you for bringing so much to the conversation and uh, helping our audience invigorate their confidence and their hope and their sense of a light at the end of the tunnel. We'll talk again soon. Bye-bye. Bye. And check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.